met my wife in a, uh, a restaurant in, in Manhattan. We've been married uh, over 50 years, 52 years this year. And it's been a wonderful life, and it still is. Well, he was, he was a different kind of father, really, for his time. He made me believe that I could do anything. He was everything. I mean, really, he was an exceptional husband. My dad was the best dad in the whole world. He was very proud of his service to the country, and uh, we were proud of him for that. He did everything with us, his children, took us on vacations. He's not who he was. So I've lost my best companion. I've lost my support. I've lost my funny guy. When you're, when you're young, you have no idea that this happens to you. One of the things that is often a question in my practice, Heather, what do I say to him? You know, the communication with a person who has dementia is one of the most common problems, and it starts early in the disease. I mean, how many people have thought at one time or another, you know, this person with dementia and I are not on the same page? You know, somebody might even say, take me home. And you think to yourself, we are home. Not only are you not on the same page, you're not even in the same place. He's 85 now, so I probably noticed it approximately 10 years ago. Uh, we would be at family functions, and I noticed that he would start to repeat the same things. And I would look at him a little strange, like, well, he just said that. Why is he saying that again? And uh, we didn't pay too much attention to it for a while. And then he started to forget more and more. It just got to the point where his short-term memory was gone. He was living so much in the past that uh, he wanted to constantly go home to Brooklyn uh, to his mother and father. Uh, to my mother and my sister and I. And we would all be standing in front of him. And, uh, but that's what, what he wanted. He wanted us, he wanted my mother young, he wanted us smaller, and he wanted to go home to Brooklyn. Communication breaks down with this disease and it actually makes the caregiving experience different than caring for somebody with another kind of disease. Watching my dad with the dementia is, is just as bad as you know watching a, a, a different type of physical disease like a cancer or something setting in on people. To go there and see him regressing mentally, um, it took a toll on him and it, you know, it took a toll on us. Scientists have looked at the special experience of family caregivers taking care of people with dementia and compared that difficult experience to the experience of caregivers taking care of folks with other illnesses. Dementia caregiving, when compared to other types of caregiving, weighs heavily in the burden on the caregiver the negative health outcomes for caregivers of people with dementia are higher than caregivers taking care of someone with even in-stage cancer, renal disease, heart disease. It's actually in this population, folks caring for people with dementia, where we see caregivers actually dying before the people with dementia die. My mother's health really started to decline more emotionally and mentally because she was just you know, here's this man that she expected, and she kept saying to me, I didn't expect it to turn out like this. Um, you know, she expected to spend the rest of their years in this lovely little cozy home, sandwiched between her two children and her grandchildren around her, and uh, she started to not be able to cope with what was happening with him, and her health deteriorated. And uh, then we found ourselves running to doctors all the time with her. <laughs> uh, so we really, we were getting hit from all angles. This kind of caregiving experience is fatal stress. One of the reasons it's so difficult is because communication is so hard. In order to understand what makes communication so hard and build a toolbox of strategies that work to help us communicate better with people who have dementia, it's necessary to look inside the brain 
of someone with dementia to understand how this disease changes them. These two brains come from the University of Alabama. They were selected from two fellas because those two fellas were as similar as two guys could be. With one difference, the brain on your right has had Alzheimer's disease for about 10 years. So there are some obvious differences about those two brains. I mean, if you're looking at it, one of the first things that comes you know, to mind is that the brain on your right is so much smaller. The disease will take two-thirds of the brain mass, leaving a person with just one-third the brain they started with. The other kinds of differences that you see are those spaces that are so deep and wide. And it's really when brain cells are sick and dying that they're shedding from that brain. And it's just like if you burned a place on your arm and you had some sick skin cells there, then that area would be darker. The brain on the right is darker in color than the other brain. Those sick skin cells would be darker, and when they died, they slough off, right? So it's the same kind of process in this organ. All of the darker areas represent sick brain cells, and when they die, they slough off. Some people ask, well, you know, what happens to these brain cells? It's, you know, dad's head is not sloshing around. It's not any looser up there than it used to be, and they're not coming out of his ears. So what's really happening, I remind folks all the time that your central nervous system is enclosed in that nice lining so that everything stays inside the lining between your brain and all the way down your spinal cord. And inside that lining, there's fluid that constantly washes the central nervous system, right? Well, when these brain cells die and slough off, they don't escape that nice tight lining. They just enter that fluid and now circulate constantly up and down the central nervous system. That's why.